Hey, this is Jay. And this is Chelsea. Welcome to the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. We are bringing you inspiration to live a more creative lifestyle because our favorite people are the ones that choose the path less traveled. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 43rd episode of the Shifting Perceptions Podcast. This is Chelsea. This week, we sat down with Kara Golden, who is a force to be reckoned with. An insanely successful entrepreneur, she is on a mission to improve the health of millions. We spoke to her about her early influences, what fuels her passion for healthy living, and how she stays motivated to inspire herself and others. Kara is the CEO and founder of the healthy lifestyle brand, Hint Inc., based in San Francisco. Their products include fruit-infused carbonated beverages and non-carbonated beverages that are free of artificial sweeteners and preservatives, naturally infused caffeine-based drinks, and a scented sunscreen spray that is oxybenzone and paraben-free. Throughout her career, Kara has won numerous awards for her contributions to society and her business acumen. Named as one of Fortune's most powerful women entrepreneurs, as well as Forbes' 40 women to watch over 40, Kara is a trailblazing innovator who proves that women can and will do it all. This awesomely insightful hour-long episode takes a deep dive into how Kara stumbled upon the benefits of healthy living, the challenges of juggling family life in the world of business, and the importance of both personal and professional growth. I know you're going to love this one. It's deeply inspiring, and you've probably heard of Kara through the years, so I hope you enjoy getting a little piece of her mind in this episode. Let's jump in. What's up, everyone? This is Jay Alders, dad of three, co-host, artist, based in New Jersey, husband of Chelsea. Um, yeah, so we have a great episode for you, uh, as always, and a couple of quick announcements. If you guys haven't hit subscribe yet, please click subscribe on your app whatever player you're listening to uh, please connect with us on social media we love hearing from you guys we respond to pretty much everything and oh here's my daughter hi summer you want to say hi what would you like to say what's your name summer summer, summer, summer. what do you want to say to the planet earth we're going to our grandma and grandpa's house going to your grandma and grandpa's house yeah okay Everything for two sleeps or one? Okay. Three or two. We're going to go for one or two sleeps. We're going for one or two sleeps. Daddy, we're going straight to the <laughs> All right, Judah. I'll talk to you guys in a minute. If you'd like to check out my artwork, you can check it out at jalders.com. I've got merch, apparel, gifts, art prints, limited editions, all kinds of cool stuff. I also have a free newsletter. I actually just started this past week my first big wall mural, my first street art attempt, and uh, I'll give you some updates as I progress on that. I'm going to go back next week and work on it some more. My wife and co-host Chelsea is a birth doula. You can check her out if you are popping out a baby soon or know someone that might be. You can check her out at ohmmamasdoulas.com. And we had a uh, really entertaining and deep uh, outro on this episode. So after, if you stick around to the end of the episode, Chelsea and I somehow get into this uh, deep, long-winded debate about some uh, topics. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty funny and pretty entertaining. And it's like typical of how Chelsea and I uh, communicate. So if you want to hear some very unfiltered examples of how Chelsea and I debate topics, stick around to the end of the episode. Since we're interviewing a powerhouse entrepreneur, I assume we'll have a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this episode. And if you have not yet created a website for your business or side hustle, or if you need a new one, check out shinynewwebsites.com to get a new website in about a week for a flat rate. On that note, let's check out this interview with Kara Golden. Hey, Kara, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to talk to you today. Thank you. Excited to be here. So, Kara, uh, Chelsea and I would love to kind of start early on. We know you grew up in Arizona, and your dad uh, kind of worked in the food industry, we saw, which kind of makes sense for what you're doing now with, with um, Hintwater. We kind of like to know like what that was like growing up and how that sort of shaped your entrepreneurial path. 
Well, I, my dad actually, it, it's interesting. My dad was in the food industry. He launched a product called Healthy Choice, um, which was inside actually a large company initially, Armour Food Company, and then they were acquired um, by a larger company called ConAgra. And it's interesting because, um, you know, when we when I look at sort of how big companies think about things, I mean, they're they're that was sort of my my first kind of um, lesson and experience with large companies through my dad, where large companies are, you know, really good at, at, you know, continuing growth, but in terms of innovating or starting something new, um, it's just, they're just not set up that way generally. So, um, so, you know, in the case of Healthy Choice, I mean, he really wanted to start a product that was competitive to another uh, product that was out in the marketplace um, that was under the category of TV dinners. And he always thought that the Stouffer's TV dinners, which was sort of the, the top TV dinner, they called it, um, which was, you know, essentially sort of a pre-made food that you just had to heat up, Yeah, yeah. Um, was not that great. And so he decided that he, you know, really wanted a better one. And he happened to be inside of a large company and got the green light to go and do that. Um, but he, um, you know, also the, the good news about sort of starting a company, you know, within a larger company is that they have space negotiated out. So with the large, you know, grocery chains like Safeway or Kroger or Publix, and so they can just slot your product in. So you're essentially not competing outside as much as, um, you know, at, at, as much as outside with competitors. I mean, there's some competition definitely, but it's really you're competing internally for space that they already have, you know, negotiated for the overall holding company. And um, so, you know, it's interesting when I started Hint, um, you know, I had this idea and, and uh, started off in uh, Whole Foods, which is kind of considered specialty grocery. And I had said to my dad, like, how do we ultimately get this into kind of conventional grocery, like the big guys, like the Safeways and some of the others. And, you know, he didn't really know how to do that because again, it had just been a whole different process for actually getting um, your product on the shelf. But um, I, you know, I still, he passed away a few years ago and it's, it, it's interesting when I think back on it because his, his mission was always, you know, not only good and quality food, but also, you know, thinking about, um, you know, sourcing and, and, you know, where did it actually come from? And, you know, wanting a healthier item. And he was way ahead of the curve of sort of, you know, a lot, what a lot of people are talking about today, but healthy choice was such a staple in my home for my mom. I remember that so clearly, like switching from that, like 60 grams of fat in a meal to (laughs) like, she would get like the bulk, like stacks of healthy choice meals. That's really funny. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's, it was an, it's an interesting, um, you know, an, an interesting sort of like story of, of uh, the fact that I ultimately came back to it. I think, you know, being a parent myself, I now look at my kids and people always ask, like, are any of your kids going to get into this business? And, you know, I say no today, um, but you never know, you know, what, yeah. because I think they're picking up on things and learning things along the way. But, you know, even if they don't, um, you know, we've like my son who's 17 is, is working at Hint this summer and he's working on um, supply chain and, you know, they wow. don't teach supply chain in, you know, in high school or no. even college courses yeah. for the most part. It's really, you know, most schools don't actually teach like how you're, you know, actually applying something. And he was saying to me the other day that, you know, he's, uh, he's always really, you know, been pretty good at Excel spreadsheets, but he never really knew like, how it actually applied to sort of real life, you know, planning and, and, uh, figuring out all the logistics of it. And, um, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a great, it's a, it's a great advantage. I think that he has, cause he kind of knows the rest of it. You have to have a great product. You have to have a good story. You have to have a good why. Um, but now he, he really wanted to understand more of the, you know, back end infrastructure of how you actually get it to market and how you actually make sure that, you know, you have enough uh, caps and stuff to like run, you know, products so that you don't um, come up short, you know, things like that, that are, um, you know, really essential to the business that, you know, not a lot of, you know, teenagers ultimately have. Well, so I want to ask, like, so we're jumping forward from childhood to, to this big moment for you, where you were in corporate America, you were working for huge companies and 
in a really amazing yeah, place AOL, in your AOL, CNN, Time. Yeah, I mean, in a really amazing place in your career. And I feel so. A lot of our audience are sort of creative people and entrepreneurs taking these jumps. So I want to talk about like it. You know, on Wikipedia and on paper, it looks like it's such an easy like. Well, I'm having kids now, so I'm just going to leave. But what did that really look like for you? Well, I the biggest job I had from the from the beginning of when I took the job was really at, at Time Magazine, and I worked in circulation there, and you know that was a giant company. But after that, I mean, when I joined CNN and totally dating myself in the early '90s, <laughs> I mean, it was a pretty small organization. It was not um, CNN was you know not in every household like. It, they are today. It wasn't automatic that you just turned on the television and had it. I happened to be living in New York in a building that um, you actually couldn't get television unless you had cable. And, mm-hmm. and um, I liked the idea of having, you know, news that I could, when I came home late at night from my, you know, first job, I, you know, was working my butt off and came home and liked to basically see what was going on in the world. So I was familiar with the CNN brand. And then when I took that role, I, you know, really realized that, you know, gosh, not everybody is watching, you know, CNN like me. I mean, they were maybe in 60% of households at that time. So, um, so it was a small company and I got to, you know, I was only there for a few years, but I got to really see kind of the growth, um, with that company. And then, uh, I moved to San Francisco and instead of staying with CNN, I decided to take a little break and try and figure out what I wanted to do. Um, because I, I really didn't want to work for a satellite office. I wanted to work kind of for a, you know, office where there were people around and, um, you know, I could, I could meet people since I didn't know anybody when I moved to San Francisco. And I stumbled upon this idea that was actually Steve, um, jobs idea that was written up in the wall street journal and basically talking about this company called Two market that was incubated inside of, um, Apple and um, and basically it was it was taking all the graphics from um, different, you know, opportunities that were out there and putting them all on a disc. Because Steve had this idea that if um, all the graphics were actually sitting on a disc and we got the consumer to um, to basically, you know, upload the graphics by sticking a disc in the computer, um, then it wouldn't matter what, you know, modem speeds were. And I don't know if anybody listening remembers when, you know, it was baud modems were like maybe 9,600 um, baud modems. And, you know, we had to like, you couldn't actually be on the phone while you were, or have somebody in the other room on the phone while you were like trying to actually be on, um, on the internet or yeah. companies like AOL. And so I really thought that it was like a smart um, way to develop a product that ultimately led the consumer to, you know, do bigger things. And um, I noticed that they were uh, just outside of San Francisco and San Mateo. So I reached out to them and ended up um, getting a role uh, with, with uh, not with Apple, but with this um, small company that had spun out of Apple called Two Market. And about six months after taking that job doing business development, um, another company that had come along that I had barely heard about was um was called AOL and and America Online and they invested um in this company and uh and then ultimately acquired us a few months later and I had been on some of their competitive services like CompuServe and Prodigy um but I found that it was really text based and so I thought you know gosh this is a great idea it's sort of taking this online services idea to the next level and then um they, Steve Case and Ted Leonsis also had this other idea. They were running AOL. They had this other idea for um, for buttons on the service. So there'd be a button for news, a button for sports, and a button for shopping. And once you click that on, you'd be populated with you know what you were really interested in. And so they asked me to run the business development effort around shopping. And you know I was like I was I was scrappy and and had no idea what I was doing, but I was willing to jump in and try and figure it out. Right. And, um, you know, it was probably one of the best things I ever did and ran their e-commerce and shopping until, um, I left seven years later. And, um, and, you know, again, it was like, these were small companies that ultimately I rode the wave and they became bigger, but it was, um, I think the consistent thread is, 
you know, they weren't figured out. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a turnaround situation. It was a, you know, they were situations that were, you know, they were just companies that were really growing and, and selfishly, you know, I still say to, uh, young people and entrepreneurs today, it's like, you know, whenever you start to feel, you know, bored or, or, you know, you're not really sure what you should do next. I think that the most important thing is finding something that you're not only passionate about, but you're curious about and you're, and you, you know, can imagine yourself getting up tomorrow and excited to sort of solve the puzzle. Yeah, Um, That's what I've always like really wanted to do in every single one of my roles. And, you know, when you start feeling like, you know, you're angry or you're, you know, bored or you're having a bad day. I mean, that's, like what I always go back to, like I said, with, you know, entrepreneurs or friends or kids or whatever, it's like, you know, are you learning something? Like, do you feel like every day you're going and learning something? And that for me was, you know, I think the key thing, I I couldn't have articulated it that way when I was starting Hint, but I think like, that's what was so exciting for me about Hint is that I was, you know, stumbling upon, um, you know, the, the overall category of health, it was something I was personally really interested in. I had, um, had kids and gained a bunch of weight, and had no energy and terrible skin. And every doctor just told me to get rest and work out and eat right. And I just didn't really know exactly what that meant. But what I figured out was that, you know, this, I, I actually had an addiction to diet sweeteners and I was drinking diet soda every day. And I thought, you know, that's like, there, there can't be anything wrong with it because it's called diet. But then <laughs> right. I realized yeah. that, you know, the diet stuff was actually not giving me the healthy day that I wanted. Well, so can I ask you, Kara, at this point in your life, so had you, like, you had kids while you were still at AOL? Like, how many? I know you have four now. So where in your life was all of this timeline lying? So did you start your family when you were still in corporate America? Or did you stop and then start your family? Yeah, I had a couple of kids um, when I was at AOL, and then I was um, actually pregnant with my third when um, th- when they were going through the process of being acquired by Time Warner. And so I thought that it was like a pretty good opportunity. I was sort of thinking about, you know, I was doing a ton of traveling. I, my team was um, a couple of hundred people were either directly or indirectly reporting to me, but people that I was responsible for. And so I did a lot of it on the phone and, you know, got really got people to dial in early to, you know, calls all over the U.S. And, you know, it was great. But I really felt like in order to really scale the business, um, continue scaling the business how I wanted it to scale, I needed to travel and um you know, it's funny. Somebody asked me that question the other day. It was just having their first child. Like, how did you do it? I mean, I, the first couple of years, I, you know, really tried to, you know, create a business life where I wasn't traveling that much um, because I, you know, really wanted to be home and, and needed to be home. And, and then I found as my kids got older and, you know, they started, um, you know, being in school more that I had a little bit more flexibility. I had a nanny, you know, that was, clearly helping me and our pairs along the way too. But, um, but that was something where I really felt was, um, was, you know, it's, I never felt like I could just, there, there was never a good time to do it, but I really wanted to have a family as well as, um, as well as, you know, a job and a role that I was really excited about. Well, so then when did the levy break where you were like, this is officially become too much, like I'm gonna focus on my family? Um, you know, I never really sort of like made that decision. I think that, that it was, um, you know, the beauty is that I sort of like just watched the timing and it very much naturally kind of seemed like the right time. I mean, yeah. you know, if your company is getting acquired, which is what was happening, I, I sort of had, you know, the option to kind of go and do something else. So that yeah. was, um, but I never said, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. I mean, I think, you know, we, I just really believed that, um, that it was just a good time for me to go. It was a billion dollars in revenue to AOL too. So I felt like, you know, like why not just sort of like hang my hat on that and go and do something else. Right. That's a huge accomplishment. Absolutely. 
Hey guys, as always, we wanted to just give a little bit of a shout out to the companies that support us. The biggest one these days being Beauty Counter, um, which our link is beautycounter.com forward slash Chelsea Alders. And I think just a little bit of a tidbit into the um, understanding why we chose Beauty Counter. And that would be because they're one of the only brands that is actually following elevated regulations in other countries, because guess what? Our own country does not have any. Um, we literally have not changed our uh, skin product regulations through the FDA since World War II. So Beauty Counter has decided to change that. While our country only bans about 100 products, the EU and Canada is currently banning up to 1,500, which those are the standards that Beauty Counter has chosen to follow. Um, it's just a little unnerving to know that everything we put on our skin, um, which honestly absorbs almost more than what we put in our mouths, um, isn't regulated. So we chose this brand to follow in the footsteps of the amazing founder, Greg, and really get the information out there. So if you want more information on this brand, you can head to beautycounter.com forward slash Chelsea Alders. You can become a brand ambassador, a consultant, or you can just purchase. Um, there's lots of perks. If you want more information, you can email us and get started on cleaner beauty. So how did you go from having this idea to improve your health and improve your skin and, and come up with hint water? How does that go into becoming a company? Because from what I see on Shark Tank, drink the drink business is fairly competitive, <laughs> right? So at, at what point do you what advice can you give to people where their passion and their idea may may or may not overlap into a realistic business plan? Like how do you how did you have confidence from the business experience you had before that to say I'm going to jump into this very competitive field and start and grow and scale this this new idea for a company? Yeah, well, it you know, again, it was it was a time in my life when I was I decided to kind of search for that perfect opportunity and um, that perfect opportunity for me, um, you know, was, I wasn't sure what it was. I wanted to do something where I felt like, you know, I was giving back in some way. And I also wanted to, um, to go for a role that I wasn't going to be doing as much traveling. I mean, at the time, this was like 2001, 2002, I really felt like it was, um, you know, there was tons of stuff going on in Silicon Valley. Um, there was, you know, lots of startups that were happening. And, um, and then there were some companies that were bigger and kind of competitive to AOL that also were interested in potentially pulling me in. But for me, I felt like I was, um, again, going back to kind of learning, I, I felt like while I could go do, you know, I used to view it as a AOL 2.0. Um, either for AOL or for another, you know, a competitor to AOL, I felt like I wasn't necessarily going to be learning. People wanted me to go and build big teams and, you know, and manage lots of people. And that, and, you know, selfishly, I didn't really want to do that. I, I know that about myself today that, you know, I'm really a, I'm a high growth person. Um, that is, you know, that's, that's what I enjoy. I love the growth aspect of, you know, coming into companies or, you know, developing my own product and going and doing something like that. So I think, um, you know, it was, I was short, I was searching for that kind of thing in tech, um, where I wasn't ultimately going to be like, you know, leading or hiring a whole bunch of people in there. Um, and while that was happening, I was also, you know, trying to lose the extra baby weight and, you know, and like I said, just, get my skin and get my energy levels up. And that's when, you know, I really stumbled upon the idea that if I could actually get myself to drink more water, that that would be a good first step. And, and for me, water was like a chore. I, I mean, I remember the first year when I just got off of diet soda altogether, I was drinking um, just plain water and I did it, but I would like literally line up eight glasses of water on the counter um, at home and make sure that I was actually going to drink those every single day, which, you know, seems really silly. But for me, it just like, you know, I was an aspirational water drinker, but just never did it. And so in order to get myself to enjoy water, I would started slicing up fruit, throwing it in water. And then, um, you know, over the course of um, 
six months, actually, I lost a, I lost all the baby weight. I had lost 55 pounds um, just by, you know, getting off of diet soda. And like I said, I was working out, but I wasn't running marathons. I was just doing normal exercise. And so one day I was shopping in Whole Foods and, and you know, asked the guy that was stocking the shelves in the beverage aisle if they had a product that just um, had fruit in it in water but didn't have any of the sweeteners. And, you know, it, it was amazing to me and, and somewhat shocking that there was no product like this out there and that people were, um, you know, that people like the closest thing to it was really vitamin water, which had more sugar in it at that time than a can of Coke. Yeah. And so I started having dialogues with, um, you know, merchandisers in Whole Foods around um, this, this whole idea that, you know, th- a product was calling itself water, but it really wasn't water at all. And because it had all the sugar in it. And, um, and, you know, he realized then that like, he was just like, gosh, I've like fallen into this, like healthy perception versus healthy reality path. Like you described with your diet soda, um, addiction. And, and again, I felt like at that point, I really had this aha moment. Like I should actually figure out how to package what I want. Cause I bet there's a lot of other people out there that would potentially buy it. But again, I knew nothing about like developing beverages, even like phoning my, my dad on this. I mean, you know, he had really been dealing with food and, and kind of flash freezing, you know, food and which is a very different process than actually creating, you know, a a beverage. And, um, and so he wasn't a whole lot of help on that front. And then um, actually when I just decided, okay, I'm going to develop this product. I I didn't even call it a company when I initially um, was launching it. I said, I'm going to, you know, develop this product, I decided I had to tell my husband because I was removing $50,000 out of our bank account. (laughs) He might think that I'm taking off to go to Tahiti or something. And um, he, uh, and I told him, you know, I had this idea and I really wanted to, you know, I earned some money at AOL and I really wanted to see if it was a possibility um, to actually create this product. And, you know, he thought it was kind of a crazy idea, um, but he wasn't really going to argue with me because he, he, you know, knew what, drinking a lot more water had done for me from a health perspective. And, um, and then, you know, we went after I sort of enlisted him to kind of help me think about, um, you know, the, the process behind actually developing a drink, but also um, how do we actually, you know, get a shelf stable product. He had been, um, he's an intellectual property lawyer. So he had sort of been around some science, but he had actually, um, thought that he was going to go more into science. He had done a lot of molecular biology research um, in, in, while he was in college and also in high school at Cornell. And so he sort of like, you know, understood a lot of the theories behind science and trying to figure out how to do it. But no one was doing a um, shelf-stable product without using uh, preservatives in it, which is I didn't want any sweeteners in my product. And I didn't want any uh, preservatives in it. So you know, he was kind of my, my first, um, my first friend to sort of join me, but also, um, uh, you know, he came on as uh, our first employee and, and, um, and 14 years later, he's still here That's wow. awesome. so, you, and I'm did, still married to him. So hey, look at that. <laughs> That's yeah. a big accomplishment. So, uh, but he, you know, he really thought early on, you know, that, like I said, he thought it was a crazy idea, but he also, um, you know, really, believed that I was on to something when I articulated that, you know, there's so many things to like back then and even worse today that are out there like, you know, heart disease and type two diabetes and, and lots of things that seem to be growing. And yet if we could actually, you know, be better at changing our diets, I mean, could that actually change the ultimate outcome of your health? And Um, and I said, like, obviously the biggest thing for people today and the, the biggest hindrance in getting people to actually drink water is that it's just boring. <laughs> it's everybody knows they should drink more water, but you know, people just don't because they just don't find it that appealing. Well, so are you shocked by like, you kind of created like a section in the grocery store now? Like, do you feel like you were part of that? Like that lead to, cause now that it's like infused, oh, water. infused yeah. and LaCroix and there's like yeah. a million options now. 
Um, so you well, were the first you know, one it's out there. Well, you know, interesting we started out when I launched Kent, it was a still water beverage. Um, so it was, um, you know, the same product that you see today. And then, you know, a few years later, we, um, there were products that were um, carbonated waters that were on the shelf that didn't have sweeteners in it, yeah. but they actually had sodium. And so, you know, I didn't want to sort of go from trading off my sweet addiction to a salty addiction. And, um, and it's, uh, those products were actually carbonated waters, which we have today. It's called Hint Fizz is actually easier, um, to do because the carbonation kind of acts as a, um, stabilizer, um, in the product. And so, um, so, but that was really, um, what we did that was just really mind blowing, um, that I hear from people who have worked in manufacturing for years is this idea of creating a shelf stable product that uses real fruit to actually, um, flavor the product. And, um, and that was, that was really something that was, you know, crazy innovative, but you were asking about the, the shelf, the shelf space and sort of creating space. I mean, I remember the old days of, you know, going into some of these grocery stores, including Whole Foods. And, you know, we got lucky in San Francisco where we were um, actually talking to the local buyer and getting it on the shelf. But, you know, once you actually want to go into different regions and go into more stores, you, um, you know, you really have to go into these buyers and try and find, you know, a way for them to put you into, you know, a space or a planogram or whatever. And the, um, the feedback was like, where do you guys fit? I mean, like, we love the product. It tastes great. But like, do you belong in, you know, these enhanced waters and every enhanced water had sugar in it. And, you know, in the plain water section, um, we weren't really that either. And so, you know, we had created, we didn't realize that we had not only created a product, but we had created an entirely new category that, you know, was like not fitting into the Kroger puzzle or the Albertsons puzzle. So we had to just, you know, keep going back to them and explaining, you know, if you actually like look at categories as a whole, you know, you, you're giving some of these categories more and more space when they don't actually deserve it because consumers are, you know, drinking less diet diet sodas. So why do you keep growing that category? I mean, that's crazy. And, and so whole, you know, understanding of real estate, um, you know, and how large companies work and, you know, things that like, in addition to actually figuring out the, um, the process to actually make the product and just lots of like, lots of learnings. And, you know, I would say that to this day, I'm still learning. I'm constantly, you know, which sounds like that's the enjoyable part for you too. Well, so yeah, I, I, totally. feel like, I feel like that's the part I want to ask. Cause I, you know, I try to be empathetic in that phase and you're like, I, I can picture myself being like, Oh, well, I've conquered all these things. Like I brought AOL to a billion dollars and you know, all those things. And then starting from this place of, I don't know this world at all. Was that ever terrifying or was it always just exciting? Like I get to jump into this new thing I get to learn. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, at points, it was like scary along the way. We didn't know how we were ultimately going to do it. But I think, you know, I've I've always viewed like, you know, product development, for example, and sort of trying things as like, that's, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You fail. And, you know, as long as you don't spend a lot of money failing, um, then, you know, you're going to learn things along the way. So it's a big you know, it's sort of how I, it's how I run this company. It's how I run teams, it's how I run my family. Like, it's like, if you can actually look at the risk and say that, you know, you think it can happen and if it happens and it's going to be a big payoff, um, then you should go do it. Right. Versus actually having, you know, a potential failure hold you back. Yeah. What's, what were some of the lessons along the way that, um, if you maybe knew about when you first started, it might have surprised you. Whether was was it a very comfortable situation going into it, or was starting this this brand from the beginning just a, a really uh, bumpy road? And and what lessons did you take from that along the way? Yeah, I mean, I think I the the big one that I learned I think early on is that you know when we were actually getting going and starting to you know 
we were learning every day because we didn't know much about the industry. And um, finally, you know, a couple of people mentioned this to us, but then also, you know, we felt like, oh, yeah, that was probably a good decision. We we try and find people who had, you know, grown up in Coke and Pepsi because we hadn't and bring in that expertise. And, you know, there's plenty of consultants out there that will actually tell you that, you know, they're going to wave the magic wand and it's all going to be like perfect. Right. And yeah. the reality is, is that when we hired people who had, you know, big industry experience, they were not only, you know, adding an expense to our company, but also um, they typically didn't know how to be scrappy and sort of start from the beginning. And that's really what we were doing. I mean, they didn't know how to sell into grocery buyers with um, that, you know, were saying no to them because their category didn't exist. They didn't know how to create a shelf stable product. They were just sort of following the roadmap that um, that Coke and Pepsi had, you know, taught them in their great training programs. Yeah. And so, again, I felt like that was really something that, you know, I learned along the way that, you know, passion, and I say today, passion trumps um, experience any day. Um, and curiosity is another one where people are, you know, it's, that's the key thing that, you know, if you can get somebody who's just really like loves what you're doing and emotionally excited about it and curious, um, then, you know, that's definitely something that is much more important. What kind of, uh, what kind of failures along the way have you had? Have you had any, any just glorious, uh, blazes of failure that, uh, make good stories now? Yeah. I mean, I, I think one in particular that I think about, and I don't necessarily like to think of it as a failure, but something, it was an upset, I should say, in okay. our, in our mm-hmm. company along the way. But I remember... Is that a rebrand of failure and upset? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Early on getting into Starbucks and, you know, that was like, that was definitely, you know, a, a home run. And we initially thought that we were going to do a small test. And then prior to the test, they asked if we could roll out you know, in all 11,000 stores and, and, um, you know, it was exciting. And we went to them and we said, listen, you know, what is success for you guys? And we, you know, thought we had a good grasp of exactly what success looked like. They had told us that, you know, if we were doing a bottle and a half per store per day, then that was pretty good. And, um, we were, you know, cranking along it's like 18 months into the relationship and we're doing like three bottles per store per day and one day I got a call from the buyer and it was a new buyer and you know she said I've got bad news for you and I said you know somewhat joking but somewhat serious oh, it can't be that bad I mean we're doing you know three bottles per store per day and she said well the problem is is we're actually gonna um we're actually going to uh, remove you guys from the case because um, Howard Schultz wants to put more food with higher margins into, you know, the case. I mean, we were selling in Starbucks for two bucks a bottle and, you know, he could sell sandwiches for 10. Right. And yeah. so it was, it was just a, you know, it was a different model and, you know, I was super bummed to hear and even more bummed to hear that it was actually happening like next week oh. um, versus like, yeah, which, you know, when you're a small company and you've got like millions of dollars that's supposed to be coming in, um, that you were counting on. And, you know, they were just saying that, you know, they were going to make the shift and, you know, again, like it's sort of kind of another lesson learned in between there when you have your eggs in, you know, one basket or, you know, you have a significant amount in one basket, then I, I always tell entrepreneurs to have a quick celebration about that, you know, that, that like victory, but then figure out how do you actually um, diversify, you know, so that you've got a lot more like victories and not just be trying to figure out how to make that one account keep going. So that was really, um, that was, you know, a bad day at hence. And I, you know, if I had a uh, timeline, like that was a day that I really, you know, sat there and looked at, wow, this is a, um, you know, this is a tough day. But then what I realized and it took me a couple of days and some tears, which I don't typically have, but I definitely <laughs> did have that day. Yeah. I, um, I ended up, um, you know, realizing that, you know, Starbucks actually had like created a huge opportunity for us, which was to expose lots of states that we wouldn't have been in yet and lots of consumers to our product. And, 
people were buying our product at Starbucks. And so many people had told us like, that was the first place that I tried it. And so now I needed to figure out how to articulate to consumers that we're still out there and they can still buy us, but we need to get into, you know, other places. And, um, and it, and basically like while I was thinking on that, we got a call from Amazon and Amazon was starting their grocery business. And, um, I actually, somebody that I used to work with ages ago, um, at time was working on this Amazon team and, um, they wanted to purchase our product and, you know, warehouse it. And, and, um, I said, you know, listen, we don't have a whole lot of, um, I didn't know if I should tell him that we were, you know, kicked out of Starbucks because he had told me that that's where he had originally seen it. And so, um, you know, I said, listen, we've got a lot of Blackberry water, which is the only product that Starbucks carried in our warehouse. And if you guys would be interested, you know, we could definitely tell you that tomorrow. And so they did. And we quickly became one of the top products on Amazon grocery. And, um, and that basically, you know, like that opportunity, maybe it would have happened if we wouldn't have been in Starbucks. But mm. I have to believe that, you know, the fact that the buyer had seen us in Starbucks, that made a difference, right? Because so, we weren't in any Seattle stores yeah. at, at the time. And so, I, Kara, I have to um, I have to ask you. So hearing that, I'm wondering, do you have um, a belief in like the law of attraction? Like, is that it seems like you have a belief in like, Huge. yeah. So can you tell yeah. us about that? Cause it seems like you're great at goal setting and achieving things and kind of reframing things to reframing a potential failure as something like, well, the universe meant to do that. Can you tell us how you might apply those sorts of mindsets to your life, uh, whether it's work or yeah. family? I mean, I think that, you know, as I always say, like hindsight 2020, I mean, I can, I can go back now and really, um, you know, see how new opportunities are, you know, come from, you know, ones that didn't work out so great. Right. So, so I always tell, you know, people around me too, that if you're, if you're feeling like, you know, everything's falling apart right now, like, you know, just know that the, you know, that there's light at the end of the tunnel somewhere and you just hope that, you know, the light will come soon. Right. Yeah. That's the best thing that you can hope for. And I mean, whether it's in life or business or whatever, I mean, it can't just stay gloomy. Right. And so what I'm always encouraging people um, to see, you know, if when some bad opportunity, you know, situation happens, it's like, listen, you just have to be really open and available to kind of hearing from, you know, lots of different people. I mean, if I wouldn't have taken that email or that phone call from the person from Amazon that day, because again, they weren't selling grocery on Amazon. Amazon was selling, you know, beyond books, which is what they started out doing, but they, they hadn't gone into sort of food in any big way. So, you know, it was a little outside the box. And, and, um, but again, I think it's just a, I'm, I'm a huge believer in that, that, things are really meant to be and you have to, you know, believe in it. And again, I think it's, it's hard when you're in a situation where, you know, bad things like are happening to you. And, but I think if you can like look back and try and see when these kind of opportunities, when good things happen to you, did a few bad things happen or you you perceive them as bad prior to that good thing happen is, is um, how I like to look at it. Yeah, it's like one thing with stuff like that where you look back and find the lessons. I think it's a way another level when it's happening to you and, and you're saying, hey, this is part of the plan. It's it's much easier when it's already happened and then you're like, oh yeah, that's why this happened, you know? But when you have the foresight to sort of say like, okay, this has happened to me before and therefore, you know, I, therefore, you know, I have to believe that, you know, it will, something great will happen. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I, I, I just am a huge believer in that, you know, on a daily basis when things, you know, don't look so great, but then, but then all of a sudden, like something good happens then you're like, aha, I've had a mm -hmm. lot of those aha moments, you know, in life. And, and, um, you know, I, I look back on, I mean, not related to business, but I look back on, you know, meeting my husband in, in New York and, um, I had, I grew up in Arizona and was living in New York um, when I met him, but I 
I broke my knee in New York and slid on a sheet of ice oh. and pretty b- crazy bad accident and had knee surgery, went back to Arizona and had seen a friend of mine randomly. Um, and he was in law school at NYU and he was just back on, on break. And we ended up uh, realizing we both lived in New York. And, and so he was the one that ultimately got me to go out one night once I was back after recovering in Arizona. And that's when I met my husband, like never would have happened if I wouldn't have broken my knee. Yeah. Right? Isn't that Probably crazy? Not. Yeah. Like, like that I woe just, is I me never moment. I wouldn't have been back in Arizona. It's just like, you know, so it's a, uh, it's very, it's, it's happened so much in my life. And, and, you know, today also he's the chief operating officer of our company. Would my company ever be off the ground, you know, if it weren't for him, you know, really supporting me and, and being, you know, what he is to this company in terms of actually figuring stuff out. Yeah. Well, so that's what I want to, that's what I want to ask Kara is like, so I know now you're doing a lot of public speaking, you're doing your own podcast, you're doing so many amazing things. What is your day to day with Hint these days? Um, I'm, I'm still, well, will always be the founder, but I'm still the CEO of okay. the company. So it's crazy. I'm, I'm, um, you know, making sure that the ball is rolling. I have a great group of, um, senior, uh, members of, of the team that, you know, are really, um, even more so making sure that it's <laughs> going, um, forward. But, um, but, you know, I think that the way that I've set up this company too is, is is kind of another learning point which is um you know it it drives me crazy when i hear entrepreneurs say that you know they're not really the finance people or they're not really the marketing person or whatever that's somebody else's job i I, with everything that i've done along the way i'll kickstart something whether it's new product development or or um you know our online business that we started shortly after we realized that Amazon was actually able to sell our product online, um, which is like 40% of our overall business. But it's, it's, I'm constantly learning about how to do those things. And it's often just me rolling up my sleeves and, you know, figuring out how to actually do those things. How do I figure out, you know, how to produce a product and see how much pH is in it? How do I do SEO on our, you know, on our PR pieces, how do I do all that kind of stuff? And then once I see that it's underway, I go and find somebody who, um, who, you know, potentially has run those kind of businesses before, um, which is different than, you know, what I was talking about in the early stages. Like, I feel like if you're going to hire people that are, you know, really focused on, on kind of like growing verticals, um, you you sort of have to have um, you have to be beyond sort of like two people working out of your home, right? You have to you have to actually get it going, and it has to be running, and then you know hire people in who can actually grow those different types of businesses. Yeah. So I know you expanded to like sunscreens. Are there is there a public um, vision that you can share with us of where this is headed? Do you have like a, a uh, like a vision board, so to say, going back to the law of attraction of where this could lead or where you, where you see this leading? Yeah. I mean, basically we, uh, a couple of years ago, I mean, I, I had a personal situation where I had, um, some pre skin cancer stuff on my nose and I really started, you know, thinking, gosh, I don't really wear sunscreen as much as I should. And why is that? Because I just didn't feel like the experience was that great that, you know, I, I, actually zinc oxide made me itch and um, made, especially on my face made me break out. And I, I just, um, I didn't want to use it. And so when I started looking at sort of the sea of sunscreen options out there, it was, um, it reminded me of the beverage industry when I was starting mine. I mean, I thought, you know, I don't really know whether or not once I put the sunscreen on, it's going to work or does it smell good or does it actually feel good? And um, then I ran across an ingredient that um, was used in over 95% of sunscreens called oxybenzone, which um, the the research that I had found was that oxybenzone was actually suggested um, by the F- by the Center for Disease Control um, to not approve it because it could exasperate precancer cells under the skin. 
And um, so I thought, gosh, why is it that, uh, why is it A, that the FDA approved it back in the 70s, but B, why is it that, um, you know, more people don't know that this is an ingredient that could be a problem in a day and age when, you know, more and more people are getting skin cancer. And so I, um, I started, you know, asking the question, like, why is oxybenzone and what's the use of it in sunscreens and do we really need it? And um, so I started, I went back to my kitchen, started, you know, making my own sunscreen. And then one day I had the fruit extracts um, in my kitchen uh, that I was using actually to make some waters and some new products there. And I thought, gosh, I wonder if I could just add this to the sunscreen and what it would smell like. And I realized that like, you know, the grapefruit smell was just amazing and nobody was doing that. And um, a friend of mine who had worked for uh, L'Oreal had been over and tried it. And, you know, we were outside and, you know, I realized it was working. And, and basically she just said, you know, in order to actually sell this product, you need to get FDA approval. So I went and, you know, basically applied for the FDA approval and wasn't even sure how to really do that. But, you know, there were online forms to go do that. So I did that and then, um, you know, waited to see what would ultimately happen. And, and then it took a while, but we almost a year later, we got the FDA approval. Um, and so that um, hint was just a holding name for because I needed to file um, with the FDA. So I wasn't even thinking like, oh, Hint can be a platform. But when we launched sunscreen, it was, you know, interesting. There were clearly people saying like, okay, water and sunscreen, like, I don't understand what you guys are doing. (laughs) But then, you know, there's other people who were saying, of course it is, because you're like a trusted brand, you could do so many categories. So you'll actually see us hit other categories this year that you know, hopefully most consumers will say, gosh, why didn't I think of that? Like, that's the perfect thing. And, you know, why, why, you know, why wouldn't I trust Hint? I've trusted them with, you know, understanding what I should be putting into my body. Why shouldn't I be trusting them about what I should be putting on my body or in my home or, or whatever? So, I mean, that's essentially what, you know, we've turned into. And the, and the beauty you know, going back to sort of the Amazon reference, I mean, we started selling on Amazon. It was doing really great. Uh, we just decided based on, you know, what I knew from my AOL days is like, I wanted to really have that relationship with the consumer. And even more so now that I was launching this new category, because once I had launched the category, we took it to a couple of grocery stores. And and um, basically the message was, oh, we already have too many sunscreens. Like we don't need another one. And I realized that it was like, you know, while there's Coke and Pepsi sort of like running the the, um, beverage businesses and aisles, there's, you know, a lot of the L'Oreal and some of the others that are really, you know, monopolizing the the, uh, sunscreen vertical too. So I, I realized that I could actually, if I had my own website, I could just launch it on my site to actually see whether or not it was something that consumers really wanted. And I'm glad I had my own list of names and, you know, that I could really do that because if I didn't, I wouldn't have been able to launch as fast as I did yeah. and really understand whether or not it was, you know, something that was really what the consumers wanted. Can you, all right, so can you clear this up for me? This whole FDA thing just like freaks me out because I feel like the history of what our government says is healthy for you is really awful. Like I know uh, artificial sweeteners, you know, were said to be, oh, that's fine. Cigarettes, yeah, they're healthy for you. And it's like decades later, we find out like this causes cancer and that causes cancer. Have you gotten more trusting or like less trusting of like what like the FDA and and the government agencies in general tell us is good or, or bad for us. What's your take on that? You know, I think that the FDA is, um, well, first of all, I think that there's a lot of people missing um, from the, uh, you know, administration. Um, over, yeah. yeah. Basically, <laughs> since, you know, the Trump administration has come in and I, I think clearly, um, you know, there's lots of people missing. And, and so I, I, you know, on the one hand, I think the FDA has, um, they, they have a purpose. I think that, you know, they've, they've been fooled into thinking that things are, you know, better, just like consumers have, and, you know, they're not perfect. Right. And, yeah. and 
I also think that um, a lot of the people that are doing the tricking um, also are big lobbyists or have lobbyists that are, you know, saying, oh, no, 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 we're great. We want to do these studies and we want to help you, you know, figure it out. So I think it's just, um, you know, it could be the amount of resources on it. It could be that they're they're just, you know, they're not an organization that is necessarily like, you know, left clean and pure. They're they're you know, in, in many ways bought into believing that, you know, things are better than they are, but, you know, there's, there's definitely, um, you know, for, for example, one sort of shocking category that I think is pretty shocking that isn't regulated is the vitamin category. So, um, so today, you know, you can like go and launch a vitamin company and actually say that it's, you know, got vitamin C in it and this is what it does. And you can go sell it to a buyer at Target and put it on the shelf. And, you know, it's like, it's not regulated. Really? And I mean, that to me is just completely crazy. Like, oh it's crazy that you've got a product that, you know, is one way today, and then it gets acquired, and they start adding ingredients, like, you know, in the case of like soaps, there, you know, a lot of soaps in order to actually get proper shelf life and not go rancid or adding things like sulfur. Yeah. And there's a, you know, and like, again, it's like, I mean, why is it that like one formulation of something, once it actually gets green lighted to be, you know, okay to move forward actually um, has the ability to sort of change its formula like that, that to me is, is crazy. And, and I just also just think that, you know, we, we really stay away from health claims. We always, you know, people will say to us, oh, how, how many antioxidants do I get off of the blackberry water? And we're probably too honest and say, you know, we just use two two drops, two to three drops per bottle. And so you're just getting the taste right. of it. But, um, but, you know, the fact that there definitely are things out there that people are buying and, you know, they're saying that they're, you know, they'll make you, um, you know, faster and smarter and skinnier and yeah. they just don't work it is like, crazy it's, how it's it's, it's kind of crazy when you you go to a supermarket and and we don't really eat sugar and we're vegan we're plant-based so we're like super hippy dippy and like we go to a store and it's like virtually impossible to find like a protein bar or energy bar that's like sugar sugar free or low sugar it's like shocking like you look at the drinks and like you said it's like 37 grams of sugar. It's a health drink. I'm yeah. like, for real? Like it's, you have to be so vigilant on your own health and try to like dissect and marketing the so health. powerful yeah, now. The, it's the, just stat, crazy. the statistics and the information out there, you really can't trust it. And it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. Yeah. On the skincare thing, I wanted to say, I know that currently like there are, I think the current number is like 1400, um, chemicals slash whatever that they're putting in that are not regulated by the United States that are already banned in other countries. So that's like always the shocking thing where it's like our country just doesn't update our laws or our restrictions. So actually people can just get their approval when they really, you know, would be completely banned in every other country, which is horrifying. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. And, and, you know, and it's a, um, I mean, I, I look, I, I think that there's, there's things they do at the FDA that I think, you know, are, are great, but there's other, you know, in, in the case of oxybenzone, I mean, like on the one hand, I, I love the idea that they're actually, they, you know, you send in an application for sunscreen and they'll actually tell you whether or not um, it's actually, you know, got the ingredients to potentially do something, you know, positive, but when it actually comes to, um, you know, staying up on research, um, you know, the problem with things like oxybenzone and sunscreens is that, you know, it's, it's a long-term slow um, effect that it has on someone's skin. It's not like, you know, ingesting rat poison and you're going to die. Right. Yeah. And, and so there's a lot of ingredients out there. I mean, sugar is one of them. Um, I personally believe that a lot of these diet sweeteners too, are, you know, not good either. And, and, you know, the fact that we're actually tricking the consumer into believing that there's, you know, some great police out there that's actually, um, you know, be okay with, um, with a product or service and we're buying it and sometimes paying a premium 
for it or or we see it at some of these great specialty stores like Whole Foods and you know figure like oh they must have vetted it in some way therefore it's like good it's just you know it's really sad um but you know i think it really just goes back to consumers today should ask lots of questions and and try and understand what they're actually buying or putting in their body or on their body because that's you know that's super important and um and it's not it's often what i figured out is it's not always based on you know price either um because just because you're you know buying a foundation at the counter of Barney's and you think like you're, you know, gosh, I'm paying whatever, like crazy dollars to actually buy this. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of their ingredients are actually good. And, you know, in the case of like organic, I was on, I was on a panel earlier this week talking about um, fair trade and sustainability and, and organic as well. And, you know, what's really sad is like, I think a lot of, you know, founders of these companies too, that, you know, they just want to get the badge um, on, you know, their product or their service, but they just don't really understand even, you know, what the organic certification, um, you know, really, really means. I mean, today you can produce a, you know, bar in the U.S. and you can get organic ingredients coming from, you know, Mexico or China or whatever. They're already labeled organic. You know, can they sneak their way in and not really be organic at all? Absolutely. And, um, and you know, it, it happens. And that's, and that's really, you know, frustrating. But I also think it's, you know, it's super hard, too, for, for an organization to police this stuff and, and, you know, and keep up with things around, like, you know, ingredients like oxybenzone or sugar or or sweeteners. So right. And finding brands um, you like can really trust. I think that's it too. It's just like once you find that's the devastating part about brands when they get sold to these big corporations is because if you find a brand, you're just like, I really trust this brand and they don't really publicize those buyouts. So it's like just finding things you can attach to and then like stay on top of what's going on within them, I guess is the answer. Yeah, no, totally. And, And I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, another thing that I say to, to uh, entrepreneurs, I think it's a competitive advantage to where, you know, as a founder, just being out there and being able to articulate all of these aspects of their company. And because I think that, you know, if they, if they can see a founder and, and trust them and actually, you know, believe with their gut that that founder knows what they're talking about, then, um, or that that CEO knows what they're talking about, then you're, you know, in a better position to be able to sell a product because today, you know, that's not what the large companies have. Yeah. Yeah. They're strictly profit driven. And there's just so many factors in trying to be an educated consumer is probably in one way easier than ever. There's so much information, but there's just so much information. It's probably harder than ever either. So it's, it's nice knowing that someone with uh, the authenticity and the honesty that you have is, is uh, running a solid brand like Kent Water. So we we are appreciative and glad that you are doing that. And we're very thankful that you decided to join us for this interview, Kara. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there anything else that um, you'd like to promote or shout out or anything at all? Uh, nothing really. I mean, okay. if they um, you know, want to find hints that uh, we are available online at drinkhint.com or also on Amazon and plenty of other services or in big stores like uh, Target and Kroger and Publix and Stop and Shop as well as Safeway and and uh, soon Albertsons as well. Just so, not, not Starbucks. Um, Just not Starbucks. Don't go to Starbucks. <laughs> not Starbucks. Not Starbucks at the moment, but oh, okay. we would love to It's on your vision board. With them. Yeah. It's exactly. on your vision board so, still though. Okay. <laughs> Exactly. So I hope so, everyone. Well, um, thanks, you guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, you, I, hope, I hope everyone listening that might have a broken knee knows that it might lead to owning a very large, successful company yeah. someday. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Cara. Thank you, Kara. Thank you so much. This was have great. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks, you, you too, Kara. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, Chels. Um, so Kara's kind of a badass. I thought it was really cool to hear a massive brand created out of leaving corporate America and I'm in power. Yeah. But also just like having kids and deciding to do something different, which is pretty cool. What do you think my favorite part of it was? 
Uh, I don't know. Tick tock. Tick. It was the uh, when she talked about breaking her leg, how that kind of made it all happen, uh, like the whole butterfly effect, law of attraction yeah. thing. I love how, um, yeah, I love how that spiritual side of her we kind of pulled out. We could have easily like slipped past that, but I'm, I'm glad we went down that rabbit hole because I, I think yeah, it's important. Yeah, I actually kind for, of forgot about that. That's pretty cool. Great for people to see how you could be spiritual and have that, you know, law of attraction mindset and still be a corporate America badass. Yeah. I like hearing like the, that side of like um, accepting and being completely okay with the fact that you love working as a woman because I think that's yeah. something that's scary to say out loud sometimes. And I know I have a lot of friends struggling with it now where it's like, I know I'm supposed to want to be a mom all the time, but I really like my job. And that's like a confusing place to land in. And when yeah. someone like her is like a leader in our world and she just owns it and she's like, yeah, I have sitters. Like, absolutely. My husband and I run this business and we have to have people that help us take care of our kids because we want to make money and be successful. So I like that balance of it all. I like that too. I think that's a, you know, I'm going to do this, but I think that's yeah. a struggle for men and women also in, in different ways. So I think it's important for people to like, yeah, to realize that what they want is okay. I guess that's the universal lesson. Yeah, of course. I mean, obviously she is a woman, so she we're covering that topic I I at to the moment. I do the devil's advocate representing my man people. Yeah, I, it must be so hard when all the other men are like, don't you just wish you could be a stay-at-home dad? And they just like give you guilt for it. I don't know if you're being dickish or <laughs> you're being... You know I would like to... There's parts of me that would like to be a stay-at-home dad. I'm just saying that the pressure comes at women. It doesn't come at men. There's people, there's not like a group of men going like. We're having a lot of uh, well, feminist you, arguments Well, because you lately. jumped in. <laughs> that's it. That's you okay. jumped in. Bring it on. What do you have to say? That's all I had to say. Okay. I just don't know why you like can't admit that there is a bit of a like. For sure. I just am representing my gender. So I like putting a little bit two cents out there. See, that's what bothers me. Okay. Is Break because, down. because I feel like I very much try to vocalize both genders and like right. I stick up for men just as much as I stick up for women when it comes to this stuff. And you're always men need to be equal. I think people have to be equal. I'm a humanist. But you always take the devil's advocate to the men's right the men's right. Because rights side. I feel like being a white male nowadays is has a lot of hostility pointed towards the group that I just so happen to be born into. Right. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, poor white men. I'm not going to say that. But since I am a white man, I do feel a lot of that. There, There is a little bit of that um, side of like, you could say anything or you can, I don't want to say bash, but you can kind of say negative things towards white men. And because I am one, and I think I'm a pretty good person, I, it's almost like I feel like I'm grouped together, I'm lumped together with these other people that someone else might blanketly say are overall, like, quote unquote, like the the problem in society today. And I, I get that side of it. But I so I think there's like a defensiveness that comes to me. For sure. And I think it's super cool now because you get it. Because now you're seeing what it's like to be like grouped into a lump of people I've that's told that. like... Like I've always seen that on some level. That's It's a weird... Ah, I got you kind of a thing to say. I didn't say that. I didn't that's, say that's the story. You. Now you get it. That's like that's No, but a, I th what I'm saying is like if you're looking at it as society as a whole, I think it's good that white men are feeling defensive at the moment. Like they're like, "Ah, we're not like that because you, you should go. fight you just to did be." It. Like you think it's good that white men yeah, feel a certain way because they're the bad guys. Now they get it. Nope, I didn't. Nev it's implying. You just put words in my mouth. It's implying. That. You just put a lot of heavy words in my mouth. Actually, okay. you articulate Never what you said mean that by white men were the bad. Guy. Articulate it. Because I think it's important to understand that like women on a whole have been marginalized. So it's like understanding that for a very for sure. long time, we definitely totally. have been. And for men to say they understand because now they're being put into this thing is just like not like it's like, oh, now I'm getting defensive because I'm being treated terribly. Well, I think there's a part of it that has to come up that way. So it's like you are defensive so that you can see what's actually been happening. And it might not be you. But it is something you're saying you're you're defending white men. So like, no, I'm defending my. All I could do is defend myself, and it just so happens. You said you're a representative of white men at the moment. I'm saying so. that it just so happens that I am a white male. Yeah. Therefore, that's the only perspective that I can ever have in life. No matter how empathetic I am, no matter how much I strive towards seeing other sides or putting the shoes on of someone else on me. Right. It's the only lens through which I can see life. Totally. For better or worse, that's the only perspective I have. 
Right. But then I think that when conversations like this come up, it's actually like that's what empathy is, is actually jumping into the skin of someone else and actually totally. seeing. But so, you know, all right, so being my wife of and knowing me as long as you do, do I not always try to see other sides of every contradictory sides of everything? It just so happens that in this topic, you actually don't. Okay, explain it. Because whenever we have this conversation, if I say anything about like a woman, like this is so great because a woman is in power or a woman is, you always there, take okay, the like. So there's a side of that that you're not seeing. I don't think you're seeing. Okay. The side of it that I would say I've always been like this, but especially since having a daughter and especially since being an older, getting older and trying to see other sides and being more mature, there's a side of me like that that is very overly idealistic probably to the point of like it's not realistic but there's a side of me that's so overly idealistic that i hate the fact that it has to be even though i understand why there's a side of me that hates that it's it has to be labeled it has to be almost separated oh like, of course i mean i hate that too okay. so that's where i'm coming that's the place i'm coming from i'm not coming from and a I place do understand of like that, but then you know that i always want equal rights for everyone no matter what like, i hope you know that by of now I, so th therefore like i just hate that we have to constantly prolong the separatization yeah are you kidding i would love for everything to just be leveled out but right now there has to be a little bit of like a fight back because it's not for sure and I the get people that. in charge it's like not... affirmative action it's like there's a side of me that doesn't like it it thinks it's not fair i hate it blah 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 but also i see the benefit that since we've had affirmative action obviously it's progressed yes towards the most there has positive. to be a fight like that's what has but then to there's happen. a point where it also goes overboard of and course it becomes a problem and, and i then feel Trump like Trump becomes president i feel like that yeah <laughs> i feel like that's where i'm coming from at these points I I do see the benefit and the necessity. But do you see how you come off when you just like defend your own side instead of first coming it's not my in own side through... though? But okay, so that is totally misplaced. I didn't mean to say that. Okay. If you are like you definitely always take the devil's advocate. Always. But that also sounds kind of dickish when you come in with like but men are the same. Like it's not what's I'm going on more right from now. like more from the angle of like I like I feel like I have certain struggles or certain challenges or maybe and it just so happens coincidentally that i was born into the skin of a white man right so therefore i guess there's some level of it like i i don't like feeling like I, my emotions and my path has been invalidated because of the fact that i was born into this form on right. planet earth does that make sense it kind of just like i feel like you just you would have been a really good like like women's rights lesbian fighter totally <laughs> I feel like if I was, yeah, I feel like if I was a Born woman, a woman yeah. I would be the same exact way. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm coming from. Your mic is falling. I know. It has been so, this whole time. Yeah, I'm not um, coming from it like funny. A, you didn't think you'd have anything to say on this outro. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense though? Am I like not, not like... No, but I think like what I'm trying to explain to you is how you sound when you immediately jump into like the devil's I, advocate on I that I feel topic. like everyone's emotions are valid. Everyone's rights are valid. And and everyone can only look at things, things through the lens that they have. Of course. So... If I was a, if if I was not a white male, if I was a black woman, or if I was a Native American transgender, or whatever, I would I would be seeing life through that lens, and therefore. But we. This is the problem, though, is that people only see it through their lens, and now it's time to break that lens and see it through the eyes of every person standing next to you. So, like that is the problem. It's like we're always all defending our own side, right. whereas like we should be defending everyone. I don't know if I'm. I'm not defending in the way of like I'm trying to bring my thing up. I'm more – I like – I think that I'm just very idealistic in this. Like I'm a humanist and I really like just bringing everyone up to the equal. So rather than right. saying like this struggle is way more blah, blah, blah than that struggle, whatever the struggle is, and just more or less saying like everyone has a struggle and everyone's trying to evolve hopefully – and so that's kind of more the angle I'm taking it. Right. But then you look at society as a whole and that's just not what's happening. So which that's is why which get, gets like, me pissed off. Right. That's like where my <laughs> anger comes from. I, I hate that. Yeah. I hate that things aren't fair for people. Yeah. Including myself or yeah. you or anyone else. Like, so yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, this all spun out of like, it is very, it's really nice to have women working and have that as an option. So I actually got into yes. like a bit of a debate with Mo about this this week, my best friend, because she said. What's up, Mo? She's so tired of people asking her when she's going to have another kid. She's like, why is it not okay for me to just have one kid? Right. And she's like... Because she's a f really cool person. That's why I'd say. To have like more kids. I know. Yeah. Well, and so... And she's like, such a she good... has... When someone has such great kids... Yes. I'm like, why would you not have another one? Right. But then but here's it, yeah. the other side of it. So she was like, I'm so tired. Like, why doesn't... So she 
took that feminist stance of like, why don't people ask me how, why don't you go for that new job? Like, how are you succeeding financially? Like people don't ask me that. She's like, and when I listen to people ask John, they're like, like her husband, they're like, are you going to get like, what's your next raise? Like, are you going to go higher in the business? Like, what are you going to, they always ask about that stuff. They're not like, you're going to have another kid. And she's like, why is my uterus always under debate? Like, it's frustrating. But then I took the other side. And I was like, to be totally honest, we all are only asking questions that apply to us. Like, we're all selfish people, right? right? So So like, oh, there you go. It's okay when Chelsea does it. No, but (laughs) here's the thing. Like, it also goes the other way. People ask us and they're like, you're not going to have another kid. Are you? Yeah. Like, as if that's a hilarious joke. Right. And that pisses me off. I'm like, you don't have any right over my ear in the same way. Like, so I'm like, people are just curious. I think everyone has their hard wiring. Totally. But like laughing at you at your decision, whether like as if it's a total joke for us to do that. Right. But it's funny because I feel like where we are with what we do, we actually talk about work a lot because that's where we are in our heads. So we talk to people about their jobs. Like that's what we come up with. But if someone is a stay at home mom, which is a much harder job than what I do, I will completely admit. (laughs) Um, I think that that is what's on their mind. They want to know, like, are you having more kids? I have three. Are you going to have three? So like, it's just, let you. me ask you this. Are you is, pull is this, this back? no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking of curiosity. Is, is this due to the fact that men, I think men and women stereotypically have certain differences, whereas I think we're born or bred or both like where men have like, like a mission mindset, women often bond through emotional means. Is that because each gender stereotypically is focusing on different priorities? Yeah, so that's the thing I think shifting. I think women are so mission driven now. Like I think that's what's like, and that's what's going to like, what's up guys? That's what's going to like crack the U.S. wide open is all these mission driven women right now. We're just going to. You're hungry. You're waiting forever. It is time to say goodbye. You're having a very serious debate. Yeah. What do you think about this? Grayson, They're hungry. Can, you, can I ask you a question and then we'll eat some food? Come here, Grayson. I have a question for you and then we'll go eat, okay? What is your biggest struggle as a white male, Grayson? <laughs> Poopy. Uh, Poopy. Poopy. So there you, there you What's have your it. biggest struggle as a boy? Nothing. Okay. Judah's got a good. Okay, Grayson's same. got poopy. Is there yeah. anything else that's really hard being being, being a, a little boy? A boy? Poopy balloons. Poopy, Poopy balloons. balloons. There you go. That makes cool. sense. Awesome. I think he said poop on almost every podcast episode so far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're we going to close you. this off. Sorry for the heavy debate. And oh, I'm not sorry about anything. We got to go. All right. Peace. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We hope you loved that episode. Um, If you did love it and could give us some love on iTunes, that would be amazing. You can leave a review and we will give you a shout out at some point on this podcast. Also, if you guys can follow us on social media, we would love to hear from you. We are on pretty much every social media platform at Shifting Perceptions Podcast which is the same as our website, shiftingperceptionspodcast.com. We look and reply to all comments, so please share with your friends, tag us. We appreciate all the love. And don't forget that all of our guests also see all these comments, so I'm sure if you want to just have a space you can reach out, these are the places to do it. Um, We also want to give some love to our amazing photographer that has done all of our photos so far. Kevin Rigby. Kevin Rigby. Um, his website is wavelightstudiollc.com. Dot com. And also our really good friend, John Harvey, who did the music for our podcast. You can find him at Instagram at Harvey Wallbanger. So that's our uh, little rolling credits. We will be back next week.